We end here tonight with a sleeping giant, an ancient super volcano beneath Yellowstone National Park. It has been snoring for thousands of years, exhaling through the park's famous geysers. As Jamie Yukas reports, recent eruptions have some wondering if the giant is awakening. Long before history was written, magma and volcanic ash transformed the Earth into the planet we know today. As our planet got older, the eruptions gradually and steadily decreased to near dormancy. Nonetheless, some volcanoes remain active, threatening the recurrence of catastrophes long forgotten. Recent developments have prompted interested parties, including scientists and podcasters such as Joe Rogan, to explore the issue of volcanic explosions. The main reason for this is the well-known Yellowstone volcano, which is regarded as one of the most hazardous in the world, even to the extent of having its class, the super volcano. Where is Yellowstone volcano? Why is an eruption from this volcano such a big threat? Is the eruption of this volcano imminent? Should the world be concerned? Let's find out. Before we start to process the immense danger we might be in, it is necessary to understand what we are up against. The Yellowstone caldera, or the Yellowstone supervolcano, as it is more commonly known, is a supervolcano and caldera located in Yellowstone National Park. The caldera and most of the national park are located in the northwestern region of Wyoming. The caldera is 43 by 28 miles, 70 by 45 kilometers, and post-caldera lavas extend far beyond it. The caldera was formed during the last of three super eruptions that rocked Yellowstone, the Huckleberry Ridge eruption 2.1 million years ago, which created the Island Park caldera and the Huckleberry Ridge tuff, the Mesa Falls eruption 1.3 million years ago, which created the Henry's Fork caldera and the Mesa Falls tuff, and the Lava Creek eruption approximately 640,000 years ago which created the Yellowstone Caldera and the Lava Creek Tuff. For those of us who have never heard the term, a caldera is a crater-like shape created when a volcanic cone collapses owing to a loss of support from the underlying magma. So, basically, a caldera is a really big hot hole in the ground caused by the collapse of an erupted volcano. The Yellowstone Caldera and Yellowstone National Park is one of the biggest tourist attractions in the United States, but ironically, it is one of the most dangerous. As one of the hot spots for volcanic activity, hot plumes rise from below to form volcanoes, making it a treacherous and thrilling place. Considering that the last eruption here was over 631,000 years ago, some scientists believe we are due for another eruption. Joe Rogan also talks about this on his podcast, as he says that humans are susceptible to all kinds of apocalyptic events. But his guest, Michael, reminds him that this might be different as we have now reached a stage of substantial technological advancement. But with climate change looming in the distance, as well as the threat of a nuclear war, could this natural occurrence be the last straw that breaks the camel's back? Could this supervolcano really be humanity's end? While this seems like classic Joe Rogan peddling a conspiracy idea, the evidence shows that the caldera is exceedingly dangerous, a topic on which most experts agree. It is important to note that a supervolcano is a more enormous volcano that will erupt across a wider distance than an average volcano. For context, Neil deGrasse Tyson, one of the most noticeable physicists of this century, discussed the impact of a supervolcano on his program in August 2020, when the guest volcanologist Janine Krippner defined the volume of such an eruption as being at the top of the Volcanic Eruption Index. To understand the Volcanic Eruption Index, we first have to understand volcanism. This is the process by which solids, liquids, gases, and their combinations erupt onto the surface of an astronomical body. But what could cause an eruption? It is caused by the existence of a heat source within a solid surface planet, minor planet, or moon. Inside the body, heat partially melts solid material or converts it to gas. The mobilized material rises through the body's interior before, if conditions are right, breaking through the solid surface. For volcanism to occur, 
the mantle's temperature must have increased to around half its melting point. At this moment, the mantle's viscosity will be around 21 pascal seconds. When large-scale melting occurs, the viscosity rapidly drops to 103 pascal seconds or less, boosting the heat transfer rate by a million times. Volcanism happens in part because melted material is more mobile and less dense than the materials from which it was generated, causing it to rise to the surface. There are several ways to create the heat required for volcanism, one of which is Tidal heating, which is primarily responsible for volcanic activity on the outer solar system's moons. Tidal heating results from the distortion of a body's shape owing to mutual gravitational attraction, which creates heat. Tidal heating from the moon causes Earth to deform by up to one meter, three feet. However, this does not account for a significant fraction of Earth's overall heat. During a planet's early days, it would have been heated by collisions from planetesimals, dwarfing even the asteroid strike that wiped off dinosaurs. This warmth might cause differentiation, further heating the Earth. A more considerable body loses heat at a slower rate. This heat, known as primordial heat, still accounts for a significant portion of the interior heat of more giant planets such as Earth. Still, the Moon, which is smaller than Earth, has lost the majority of this heat. Another source of heat is radiogenic heat, which is produced by radioactive decay. Aluminium-26 decay would have considerably heated planetary embryos. Still, due to its short half-life, less than a million years, any traces have since dissipated. Common minerals contain trace amounts of unstable isotopies, and all terrestrial planets, including the Moon, endure some heating. The outer solar system's cold worlds are subjected to significantly less heat because they are less dense and contain less silicate material. Cryogeyser activity occurs on Neptune's moon Triton, as well as perhaps on Mars. The source of heat is external, heat from the sun, not inside. Janine also estimates that an eruption from Yellowstone caldera could cover a thousand cubic kilometers. The Earth's surface swells as magma flows into a magma chamber, or reservoir, located around 6 to 10 kilometers, 4 to 6 miles, under the park. When the magma starts to solidify and calm, the Earth collapses. Volcanologists, who have been monitoring this activity since 1923, report that the ground raised roughly 25 centimeters, 9.8 inches, between 2004 and 2009. That is a dangerously rapid expansion, which might be a sign of an approaching eruption. An eruption in Yellowstone is not harmful due to lava, since the majority of the magma may not become lava, but may instead be thrown straight up and cool with the air to produce a thick cloud of ash, ignoring the rock particles delivered. These wind-borne particles might reach unparalleled speeds, potentially killing everyone in the United States and Canada. If the ash is breathed, it forms a cement-like substance in the victim's lungs, eventually suffocating them until they die. The rest of the world is not exempted from the tragedy either. Before you go thinking that you are safe just because you don't live in the United States, the ash in the air would be thick enough to block the sun's rays, leading to a massive drop in the temperature of our planet, resulting in a mini ice age, which might sound cute, but is very far from it, as this could significantly affect agricultural sectors and ruin food production with a change in food season, as well as destroy the ecosystem, ruining livestock and wildlife alike. Scientists predict that such a winter could last up to a decade. We have not even started to talk about the societal changes such a winter would bring due to resource scarcity. There is evidence to back this up, as in 1991, pyroclastic flows rushed down the slopes of Mount Pinatubo, generating fresh volcanic deposits up to 200 meters deep. On the same day, Typhoon Yunya passed 75 kilometers northeast of Mount Pinatubo, bringing rain and heavy winds to several regions, including Manila, Subic Bay, and the Indian Ocean. Between 1991 and 1993, roughly 20 million tons of sulfur dioxide were pumped into the stratosphere and distributed worldwide, briefly cooling global temperatures by one degree Celsius. Scientists from the Filipina Institute of Volcanology and Seismology 
and the United States Geological Survey have monitored the volcano since April 1991. They predicted the eruption, allowing for a massive evacuation, saving over 5,000 lives and preventing property damage worth $250 million. Many deaths, around 840, and injuries caused by the eruption resulted from roof failures caused by wet, thick volcanic ash, which would not have occurred without the typhoon. In the years after, the deposited volcanic ash has remobilized owing to rain, causing additional mudslides and destroying bridges, irrigation canals, highways, farmlands, and urban areas throughout the rainy season. In the following 22 days, the combination of sulfur dioxide and air circled the globe, as 10 billion tons of molten magma was released into the surrounding area. Now, here's the shocker. The eruption caused the mountain to collapse, forming a caldera of about 2.5 kilometers in diameter. Comparing this to the diameter of the Yellowstone caldera, which is about 44 kilometers in diameter, leaves us to imagine how devastating the eruption would be. There was also the eruption of Mount Tambora on the island of Sumbawa in present-day Indonesia, then part of the Dutch East Indies in the year 1815, considered one of the worst eruptions the world has ever witnessed. Most estimates show that Tambora's eruption was at least a whole order of magnitude, ten times, larger than Mount Pinatubo's in 1991. An estimated 1,120 maueters, 4,000 feet, of the mountain's peak fell to produce a caldera, lowering the summit's height by one-third. Approximately 100 cubic kilometers, 24 cubic miles, of rock was blasted into the atmosphere. Toxic gases, including sulfur, were also released into the atmosphere, which causes respiratory ailments. Volcanic ash was more than 100 centimeters, 40 inches, deep within 75 kilometers, 45 miles, of the eruption. In contrast, places within a 500 kilometer, 300 kilometers, radius witnessed 5 centimeters, 2 inches, ash fall. Ash could be discovered as far away as 1 300 kilometers, 810 miles. The ash burnt and suffocated crops, resulting in an imminent food shortfall in Indonesia. The expulsion of these gases, mainly hydrogen chloride, resulted in very acidic precipitation, destroying most crops that survived or budding in the spring. The Napoleonic Wars, floods, and cholera exacerbated food shortages. The energy released was comparable to approximately 33 gigatons of TNT, 1.4 Santinto 20 joules. For several months following the eruption, the ash in the atmosphere reflected a substantial amount of solar energy, resulting in abnormally chilly summers and contributing to food shortages. China, Europe, and North America endured well-documented below-normal temperatures that ruined their crops. The monsoon season in China and India was disrupted, resulting in flooding in the Yangtze Valley and driving thousands of Chinese to abandon coastal towns. The gases also reflected part of the already decreased incoming solar energy, resulting in a 0.4 to 0.7 degrees Celsius 0.7 to 1.3 deg Fahrenheit, drop in world temperatures throughout the decade. During the summers of 1816 and 1817, an ice dam developed in Switzerland, gaining 1816, the nickname Year Without a Summer. Scientists utilized ice cores to track atmospheric gases throughout the cold decade, 1810-1809, and the results were baffling. Sulfate concentrations in both Sippel Station, Antarctica, and central Greenland increased from 5.0 in January 1816 to August 1818. This suggests that 2530 teragrams of sulfur were emitted into the atmosphere, the most of which originated from Tambora, followed by a quick reduction due to natural processes. Tambora produced the most significant change in sulfur contents in ice cores during the last 5,000 years. Using this as a measure only shows how devastating an eruption in Yellowstone would be, considering the last one was way before recorded history. What does this mean for humanity? Are we doomed to a devastating eruption? What are our chances of survival? Could Yellowstone caldera really erupt? As we have previously mentioned, the last eruption was before humans began recording history, 
So this might lead you to believe that the caldera is just lying dormant, which, however, is not the case. The entire region is flowing with volcanic activity, emitting seismic events, geothermal heat, and sporadically erupting geysers. This indicates a constant movement of magma beneath the surface. It has been likened to the earth burping, basically warning us that while most of this activity goes on beneath the surface, it could quickly become a problem above the surface too, so we should not sleep on it. An earthquake triggered Mount Pinatubo's eruption, and if we were to learn from it, we would realize that Yellowstone is an area prone to high seismic activity, meaning there is a possible chance for an eruption. However, there are currently no signs of an impending eruption. Yellowstone National Park continues to experience earthquakes and the ground rises and falls, although this is not unusual. Yellowstone is behaving as it has for the past 140 years, the USGS reports. Scientific research shows that the odds are very high that Yellowstone will be eruption-free for the coming centuries. The USGS also emphasizes that if you only look at the last three eruptions, the probability of Yellowstone exploding in any given year is 0% which is lower than the probability of being hit by a civilization-destroying asteroid. But even that is a poor estimate because it is not certain that Yellowstone will erupt in a regular cycle or that it will be overdue for another eruption. Everything from the movement of tectonic plates to the eruptions of geysers around the parks are being carried out by the United States government, leading to a general sense of preparedness for any possible eruptions. Are there other scenarios that could lead to the end of the world? Are we doomed to an apocalyptic cosmic event? What events could destroy our world? How probable are their occurrences? The most talked about and feared life-ending catastrophic events are asteroid impacts. Asteroids, our solar system's cosmic nomads, are remnants of a time when dust swirled and nebular chaos reigned. These stony fragments, left behind from the formation of our sun and planets, travel along their cosmic courses, some content to stay in the peaceful asteroid belt between Mars and Jupiter, while others explore further out. But for mankind, a disturbing question arises. How frequently do these cosmic wanderers become harbingers of doom, rushing towards our delicate blue planet? Fortunately, the chances of a genuinely catastrophic accident are quite low. According to estimates, a devastating collision from an asteroid greater than a kilometer in diameter may occur once every few million years. The cause of the dinosaur extinction 66 million years ago is assumed to have been an asteroid, with the Chicxulub crater on the Yucatan Peninsula serving as a somber reminder of its strength. However, this terrifying possibility should not mislead us into a false feeling of security. Smaller asteroids, measuring tens or hundreds of meters in diameter, offer a more regular hazard. While they are likely to disintegrate in the atmosphere before reaching the Earth, the 2013 Chelyabinsk incident in Russia in which a 20-meter asteroid burst with the force of an atomic bomb, serves as a wake-up call. Such an impact might devastate an area, and with such catastrophes projected to occur every few decades, attention is required. Thankfully, we are no longer oblivious to the possible hazards hiding in the universe. NASA and other space agencies have developed strong near-Earth object, NEO, programs aimed at detecting potentially harmful asteroids. These systems use a global network of telescopes to detect, measure, and track the movements of these celestial visitors. Early detection is critical. With adequate advance time, scientists might theoretically design deflection missions that use techniques such as the kinetic impactor approach, in which a spacecraft purposefully collides with an asteroid pushing it off its collision trajectory with Earth. Our planet's history is scarred with scars from previous encounters. The aforementioned Chicxulub crater is one noteworthy example, but there are several more. In 1908, an airburst above Tunguska, Siberia, destroyed millions of trees covering an area greater than London. The culprit was most likely a tiny asteroid or comet. These heavenly brushstrokes emphasize the importance of continual observation 
and readiness. However, the narrative of asteroids is not only about celestial warfare. These cosmic boulders contain the keys to revealing the universe's mysteries. Asteroids are rich in pristine materials, including water ice, valuable metals, and organic molecules. Future space exploration efforts may mine them, yielding resources for humanity's expanding spacefaring goals. Asteroids might serve as stepping stones to establishing a presence beyond Earth, or they could provide raw materials for the construction of space stations and other extraterrestrial infrastructure. Although the probability of a significant impact event exists, it is statistically unlikely. Ongoing advances in NEO detection and deflection technology provide promise for minimizing future hazards. Finally, these heavenly wanderers offer not just a possible threat, but also a link to humanity's cosmic destiny. By comprehending and preparing for the obstacles they may provide, we may uncover their secrets and use them as stepping stones on our trip among the stars. Are there even more supervolcanoes with even higher chances of eruption? How safe are we from continent-altering earthquakes? Will we be defenseless against a solar flare? Will there be a world-ending flood caused by climate change? How safe are we from the end of the world?